Today we read from Apostle Paul's second letter to Timothy, chapter 3, verses 16 and 17, and from Hebrews, chapter 4, verse 12. The passages are printed in your order of worship if you want to follow along there. From Timothy, all scripture is inspired by God and is useful for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness, so that everyone who belongs to God may be proficient, equipped for every good work. And from Hebrews, indeed, the word of God is living and active, sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing until it divides soul from spirit, joints from marrow. It is able to judge the thoughts and intentions of the heart. This is the word of God for the people of God. Amen, and thanks be to God for that wonderful music. Wasn't that great? Yeah. And where's Jeremy? I mean, Jeremy always does it with gusto, but he really ate his Wheaties this morning, didn't he? <laughs> Nicely done. <laughs> Let us go to the Lord in prayer. Lord, we do thank you for the gift of your church, that we can come and gather with joy and celebration for, for you, and also in honoring those who have sacrificed so much for our freedom. Lord, we give you thanks for so much. Lord, so we come to worship you indeed, but we also come to learn more about you and your word, because we know we can't do this thing called life without you, especially the way you call us to live it. So now, Lord, you've given me the amazing responsibility and opportunity to preach your word to these, my friends, and your servants. And I need your power to do it. So, Lord, speak to me and through me in such a way that all of us here do receive a word from you that will make a difference to our lives. It's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. Now, we continue our series today, Big Questions About the Bible, and that's really it. We're asking key questions about the Bible. Because let's face it, the Bible sometimes is very difficult to understand, it can be confusing, and sometimes it can be very, very disturbing. And so because of that, we're asking honest questions about the Bible so we can grow in our faith and understanding of God. Because let's be honest, that's the only way we can really grow in our faith is if we ask honest questions about the Bible and Scripture. So today you're gonna need to buckle up because we're going to take a closer look at some unsettling and disturbing passages of Scripture. Does that sound good? That's what I have planned, so that's what you're going to get. (laughs) Now, have you ever asked this question? Why is the Old Testament God so mean and the New Testament God so nice? Ever wondered that? Maybe you've also wondered, how can there be a loving God to believe in when I see in Scripture that God commands people to kill others. I remember getting a a haircut a while back, and I was having fun chatting up the the nice lady who was cutting my hair, and we were just laughing and having a good time. When she finally got around to asking me what I do for a living, always love that question. (laughs) And I said, I'm a preacher. She goes, what? And honestly, I appreciate that response, I do. She goes, a preacher? You don't seem like a typical preacher. And I said, well, what's a typical preacher? She said, well, no fun. (laughs) That's a whole entire other sermon, right? So we continue to talk, and then she said, you know, I have a confession to make. I said, what's that? She said, I'm not really a religious person. I, I believe in God, but I don't go to church very often. She said, recently a friend of mine gave me a Bible as a gift, and she said, read it, it'll change your life. And she said, I have to be honest with you, it hasn't changed my life. I have more questions than I have answers, and it's very, very confusing. And then she lifted up the question I often get. Why is the Old Testament God so mean, and the New Testament God so nice? And then she finally said, you know what, I, I, I want to believe in God, I truly do, but I really struggle with the Bible. You know, folks, that is not an isolated incident. I cannot tell you how many times I have met someone on a plane, I have met a waiter or a waitress, 
I've met someone at a doctor's office. I've met someone on vacation who has asked that very same question, who has that very same struggle. I don't get scripture. There are these passages that I read and and I don't understand them and they're disturbing and they're unsettling and how do I reconcile that with all I've heard about Almighty God? So that's the question today. How do we reconcile those passages, those disturbing, unsettling, difficult passages of scripture? For example, what about the biblical command that all children who disobey their parents shall be put to death? I wouldn't be standing before you if we practiced that. (laughs) Or what about the command, the biblical command, those who work on the Sabbath shall be put to death. Well, I'm working on the Sabbath. I should be put to death. There'll be an execution right there in the parking lot afterwards, right? Or what about the passages, the biblical mandate that women should not speak in church and should not wear jewelry? Or what about those passages that suggest that women are basically property and they should be subservient to men? What about those passages that say that men shall never cut their beards and we can't eat shrimp cocktail? What? Or what about those passages that seem to suggest that God supports slavery? What about this one from Exodus? You may recall this one. Moses comes down from Mount Sinai with the Ten Commandments, and he sees all of his people living a life of debauchery. They're worshiping other gods. They're doing perverted things. And then Moses gathers all the people who truly want to be faithful to God, and this is what he says. Thus says the Lord, the God of Israel, put your sword on your side, each of you, Go back and forth from gate to gate throughout the camp, and each of you kill your brother, your friend, and your neighbor. The sons of Levi did as Moses commanded, and about 3,000 of the people fell on that day. Yeah, that's in the Bible. And you read that, and you hear that, and you say, oh my gosh, how could the Bible be inspired by God? How could I see the Bible as a guide for my life when that's in there? How could I square that with a loving God I have prayed to and I have believed in and I have faith in in my life? How can I do that? Maybe you struggle with that. Maybe you don't like to admit that to other people, but maybe you struggle with that. But maybe you're a seeker today. Or you know a seeker and and have not made a commitment to faith yet. You're on the edge, but you haven't been able to do it because of this very reason. You struggle with these passages. And you look at the Old Testament, and you see this God who commands murder. And then you look at the New Testament, and God seems so nice. You have this God who orders executions and for people to be stoned to death. And then you read about this Jesus character who defends a woman who was caught in adultery and defended her and prevented her from being stoned to death. And you're like, how do I reconcile that? It doesn't make any sense. Or maybe you're a Christian here today, and as I speak about this in your soul, you're like, yeah, yeah, yeah. But you never talk about it because you don't want to be well seen as a heretic by these questions. Or maybe you're a Christian and you get these questions from your friends and from critics of faith, and you have no idea how to respond. So how do we make sense of it? What is the answer? How do we reconcile it? Well, folks, what I'm about to share with you this morning just may be a game changer for you if you really struggle with this issue. You may, after you hear this message today, have a totally different understanding of Scripture. You may be liberated to see finally the Bible as the inspired Word of God, and it just may take your faith to the next level. So I want you to listen closely, because for some of you today, this message is going to be a turning point for you if you have these struggles. So I want to begin with the question of the sermon today. Why is the Old Testament God so mean and the New Testament God so nice? I mean, often people have that issue, don't they? They read the Old Testament and they they say, I wonder about that. I mean, what happened? 
Did God change? Did God go see a therapist and mellow out? Did God get on medication, you know, and just relax once we get to the New Testament? It's like a little girl who was confronted by the more bloodthirsty parts of Scripture. And she said, yeah, but that was before God became a Christian. (laughs) No, let me tell you, folks, God has always been a Christian. In the New Testament of the Gospel of John, it says in the very first chapter, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Nothing came into being without the Word. And what is the Word? It is Jesus Christ the mind of God, the essence of God, the personality of God. So God and Jesus have always been the same. But look at it this way. This may help you. There are about roughly 23,000 verses in the Old Testament. Only 200 of them really contain those disturbing themes and passages. So you have about 22,800 verses of Scripture that talk about God's love, that talk about God's mercy, that talk about God's grace, that talk about God's faithfulness. So let's gain some perspective. The true issue here is that God has not changed. Our understanding of God has changed. And I'll get into that in a minute. But some of you may think, okay, Charlie, I I get that. But what about those 200 verses? I was raised to believe that you take the whole Bible as inspired by God. What do I do with those? Well, folks, to make sense of the Bible, really, and this is, this is so important, we have to understand how the Bible was inspired. And so many people just don't understand this. See if you relate to this. So many people, when they think about how the Bible is inspired, think it happened like this. That God put a trance on the writers of the Bible. Uh, And all of a sudden, God put the mind of a PhD in that writer, and they're in this trance. They have no idea what's going on. And then suddenly they wake up as if they've been abducted by aliens. And they look, and there is a document. And they don't remember any of it. That is not how the Bible is inspired, folks. Most mainline Christians believe in what is called dynamic inspiration. And that means this, yes, the Bible is inspired by God. Yes, those ideas are inspired by God in Scripture, but God inspired those writers within their own humanity, within their own frame of reference. Those writers wrote, in light of their cultural setting, in light of their limited understanding of science, in light of their biases, in light of their prejudices. God moved within their own humanity. And this exposes the living, active, dynamic quality of Scripture. In fact, this is what Scripture says about itself. I'll say it again. All Scripture is inspired by God and is useful for teaching, for reproof, for correction. That word inspired literally means God breathed. Not God coerced, not God forced, not God tranced, but God moved within these writers' humanity. Do you hear that? That means the Bible is a living, active reality. That's not some word stuck in the past, but moves within our own life and penetrates our soul. But maybe that's not good enough for you. Maybe you hear that and say, "That, that, that makes pretty good sense, Charlie, but I'm still not there. I'm still thinking about those violent, bloodthirsty passages of Scripture that I can't seem to get around. How do I do it? Well, what I'm about to share just may be the pivot point for you if this is an issue, or you have a loved one who has this issue. 
Out of dynamic inspiration is this idea, and you may want to write this down, this is important, is this idea of progressive revelation. Can you say that? Progressive revelation. Say it again, progressive revelation. And that means Scripture shows a gradual understanding of who God is. From Genesis to Revelation, we see this progressive, gradual, clear understanding of who God is. That means the writers grew in their understanding of Almighty God. Now this makes sense. This makes complete sense. Like, for example, if I really wanted to take piano lessons and play the piano like, you know, Jeremy did earlier, and tickle those ivories like he does, I don't know how to do it. I mean, I know how to play Jaws, that's about it. But, but if I say Jeremy gave me lessons and he was that patient, right? He wouldn't just give me a difficult piece of music and say, and next week, Charlie, you're gonna perform in front of the entire church. Uh-uh. He first would begin with how I put my hands on the keys. And I would slowly improve and improve. It's the same with with our faith and understanding of God. When we first become Christians, we don't have a perfect understanding of God. We don't have a perfect theology. I mean, how we saw God when we were three years old is different with how we see God now. And the Bible is a testimony to this progressive understanding of God. Hear me. Because listen, we begin with Abraham, you know? Well, there Abraham has many sons. Remember the awful song in VBS, you know, over and over again? Did you know in Scripture it shows that Abraham's ancestors' parents were actually polytheists? They believed in many gods. And yet God came along and spoke through Abraham and said, No, there is just one God. I am the Lord your God. And Abraham became the father of all nations. And then yet there was Moses who came along afterwards and said, folks, if you want to live life the way God intended, there are rules, there are boundaries. And so the people of God, they tried to follow those rules and they screwed up and asked for forgiveness and they were forgiven. And they tried to follow those rules again and they screwed up and they asked for forgiveness and they were forgiven. And that's the Old Testament in a nutshell. And then gradually the prophets came along and said, you know what, God does not want your sacrifices. God does not want you following rules. God wants your heart. God wants your mercy. God wants your love. And then gradually, guess who came next? Jesus Christ who became the perfect picture of God Almighty for us. In Jesus, we have a 2020 picture of God. So that means everything we read in Scripture, everything we read in the Bible, from the ver- first verse to the last, everything we see in the world, and everything we do to live out our faith, we interpret through the lens of God's revelation to us in Jesus Christ, the King of kings and the Lord of lords. Jesus Christ is, is the zenith of who God is. I mean, think about it. None of the Old Testament writers that, that you worry about They lived in a culture where they believed in many gods who were warriors. So think about it. All of a sudden, it comes along that there is one God. And so how do they put that into a language in their primitive culture? They say, God is the best warrior. And what are they trying to say? God is the most powerful. Yet gradually, their understanding of God and who he is would grow and grow and grow. So, the question today, why does the Old Testament God seem so mean and the New Testament God seem so nice? Folks, God hasn't changed. It's our understanding of God that has changed.
And so when we understand this, these difficult passages, they're not disturbing, they're not challenging. We see that people grew in their understanding of God just as we grow in our understanding of Almighty God. Look at it this way. Sermons are certainly not as inspired as Scripture. Some are better than others, right? But not as inspired as Scripture. But let me say this. You know, what what if in a sermon, and I do this sometimes, I stutter over a word, I don't get a sentence grammatically correct, or I forget to to give one idea that I prepared, does that discredit my sermon? Does that devalue it? Or more importantly, let me tell you, if you heard or read sermons I preached 25 years ago, oh, they were awful. And you compare them to the sermons I preach today, you would see a gradual understanding and growth of my faith in God. Does that discredit those early sermons? I hope not. Think about the U.S. Constitution. We revere that document as Americans, as we should. And yet we know when it was written, it was bound by time. When it was written, slavery was still alive and well, and and women were seen as property. And so as we've grown as human beings, and as we've grown in civilization, we've grown in our interpretation of the U.S. Constitution, and yet still revere its essence. Why can't we treat the Bible the same way? Now, in a minute, I'm going to show you how much I care about this subject, all right? Really. But at the end of the day, the Bible is not to be debated. It's meant to be read and studied. That's why I said last week that the Bible is not really a mathematical textbook. It's a, it's a literature textbook where we find ourselves into these deep stories and we struggle and we learn and we grow and we see ourselves in it. I mean, I I think of the story of Abraham and Sarah when when Sarah was told she was going to have a baby in her old age and she laughed. What did I do? I cried, I think. And I read that story and I think of how God blessed us. And then I read about King David and, and I think about those people who come into my office and they say to me, and they do, well, I've done awful things. God could never use me. I said, oh, really? Did you know the Bible is really the story of the island of the lost and misfit toys? <laughs> Have you ever heard about King David? He murdered He committed adultery, he disappointed everyone, and yet today he is a hero in our minds. I think of those who I pastor who are dying, some who are afraid to die. And I remember those words of Jesus, do not let your hearts be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In Romans 8, nothing shall separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. I think of the little children who run around here saying the darndest things, don't they? And doing the darndest things. And I'm reminded when I see that every single week, which is one reason why we do it in worship almost every single week, because Jesus said, unless we can become like those children with their kind of faith, with their kind of vulnerability, with their kind of playfulness, we will never enter the kingdom of God. That's right. I think of when there are times when the values of this world overlap the values of our faith and it gets murky and muddy and then I'm reminded of the words of Jesus, no, the last shall be first and the first shall be last. If you want to be great in the kingdom, no, in my kingdom, you're great when you become a servant. Servant. 
I think when I screw up royally, and those words of 1 Corinthians 13 of Paul pierce my heart, and they say love is patient, love is kind, is it not envious or boastful or arrogant or rude, it does not insist on its own way, ouch. It bears all things, it believes all things, it hopes all things, it endures all things. Love never ends. Scripture, messy, true. When was the last time you read it? When was the last time you struggled with it? Get in there. Get it all over you. And find out the person God has called you to be. Let's pray. Oh God, we do thank you for your word. But forgive us, Lord, when we fail to love you with our minds and interpret it correctly. Help us to see the depth of it. Help us to see your divinity within its humanity. Help us to see ourselves in it and our struggles and our pain and our mistakes and yet your love and power through all of it. It's in Christ's name we pray.